Welcome to part two of our series on mapping the curriculum for a responsive learning environment. Before we dive in, I'd like to give a quick introduction to our incredible speakers for this series. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Heidi Hayes Jacobs. Heidi is the founder and president of Curriculum Designers. She has helped schools and other organizations create modern learning environments, update curriculum and support teaching strategies for over 30 years. Her models on curriculum mapping and curriculum design have been featured in more than 13 books and software solutions throughout the world. Please also give a warm welcome to Dr. Marie Hubley Alcock. Marie is the founder and president of Learning Systems Associates. She has worked in public and private education as a teacher, administrator, and public advocate for the last 25 years. She has written more than 10 books on curriculum instruction and assessment design. Her focus has been working with schools to improve student achievement, multi-purpose mapping, instructional practices, and more. This series is also brought to you by Chalk. Chalk is a planning and analytics platform that enables K to 12 schools and districts to develop a cohesive standards aligned map for curriculum and instruction. Chalk supports millions of educators and thousands of schools throughout the world. To learn more about Chalk or to get support on your curriculum initiatives, please visit chalk.com demo. Now, without further ado, I'll hand things off to Heidi to get this started. Thank you, Sarah. And it's great to be with all of you. Uh, we're going to run through our learning targets, and obviously, if we could go back. Thank Sorry you. about that. That's yeah. okay, Keenan. You were just excited, and we all. I am. I get, all right, I Marie. All you. Okay. Right. Um, that's fine. Um, as I was just going to say, the um, session today directly connects to last week's session. For so, for any of you seeing a recording right now. Uh, we highly recommend that you take a look at the first part of this. Um, the learning targets are very straightforward. We're going to be looking at how we can use our curriculum maps to support different types, very strategic instructional grouping. We're going to be able to describe an instructional technique that can increase student achievement in five minutes or less. We want you to explore how effectively you can group your students and make choices as an instructor to increase learning possibilities. And you're going to be looking also at one of the more interesting questions of how we can group ourselves as professionals to maximize instructional possibilities. Next slide. This is our essential question. How can we prepare our learners for the future? And this wonderful image harkens back to some points we were making last time. Next slide, please. We made the point, and I hope you are, are with us on this, that we can have the most interesting curriculum going, but it takes more than that. Our learners need an environment that's responsive, modern, and and a place where they can relate and grow, as opposed to being boxed in to an environment that's confining. Next slide, please. So we lead, this leads us to the concept of the structural nest. And in our first session, we referenced our work from Bold Moose for Schools, a book that the two of us wrote a few years ago with ASCD. And in it, it was the idea that the whole is the sum of the parts and that there's a nest that teaching and learning occurs in. And that nest is composed of four structures and we can dive into each of them, which is what we're doing. But when we come back out, we want to orchestrate them so that they work in a um, congenial, supportive and um, exciting way to best serve the learners. We looked at schedules and learning spaces last week. And today we're moving on to look at the grouping patterns. Marie? So when we think about the structural nest and the grouping patterns, these are the learning targets that we really focus in on for that aspect. It's really talking about how um, this impacts curriculum designs, how we can effectively group our learners, and that's young learners and older learners. And then also thinking about how are we grouping the adults 
And we acknowledge the fact that all of the adults in the education system are learners, but we really are thinking about our staff and our professional faculty and how these are all interconnected. So we really want to zoom in right now on the learner grouping, and you could say the young learner grouping, and there are two aspects to this that become super important. One is that institutional grouping, and these are things that are put into place, you know, because of the hierarchy of our structure, the decision makers on that are outside of the learning environment. And then there is the instructional grouping, and we do have control over that as educators. So let's take a deeper dive. Heidi. Thank you. Institutional grouping is really important. And one of the things we point out in Bold Moves is often people skip it. Oh, there's nothing we can do about this. That is not so. And we're going to show you some examples of how you can. But as Marie mentioned, what we understand is as a teacher, you can't control the size of the, of the student population in the school. You may have elected to apply to a school because you like their beliefs or you appreciate the way they're organized. But here's an interesting thing. There are ways we can make adjustments institutionally that affect grouping. Here's some things that we know affect it. We know that the size of school matters. Sometimes groups are organized around belief systems pedagogical systems. You can see how, how a school's organized by age grouping and form bands. We're going to go into some of that in a, in a few moments. And a lot of that, people just assume they're powerless. Institutionally, we could have multi-age grouping. Schools sometimes group by gender. There's specialized schools that group by talent or aptitude or interest. Some schools for very specific special needs. Some schools are grouped by neighborhoods, localities, regions, some parts of the United States, for example. There are rural schools where kids are bused to a regional high school. You can see how all of this plays out, and there are other broader choices. There can be boarding schools. There could be national schools. And many of you, as I was looking at the chat, are working in international schools, which are organized institutionally very different than a national school down the block from where you're located. Next, please. So given one of the things that we, we want to start with before we get into instructional grouping, which is something you literally could do tomorrow, what we want to start to think about are there are other possibilities for institutional grouping instead of the old way of just doing it by habit. We've always done grade levels. That's how we've always done it, how we always will. We've always had an elementary, a middle, and a high school. There's different ways we can group. And think of this also, apropos last week's discussion, because of virtual possibilities, we can really group kids in totally different ways than we could even 25 years ago. So next slide, please. What we really want to begin to look at is the variable that begins with this very critical element. We're going to dive into this for a bit. And that is age of learners. Because you're all mapping in school environments and in institutional setups. There's a lot of different ways you can group. You can do it by grades. You could have K3. You could have K5. You could have K8. You could have 9, 12. You could have 7 and 8. Think of all the different variations. We call them grades. They're age level spans based on habit, but not necessarily in terms of what a student needs. We plug kids in to a grade level band. We can sometimes dispense of the idea of grade level bands and just have age spans. So for example, I remember a number of years ago working in New Zealand where there were age spans of like three five. Or sometimes, for example, in Finland, school doesn't start till the age of seven. You can see how ages go beyond the notion of grades. Certain courses banned in a high school is multi-age. There isn't ninth grade tubas, if you get what I'm saying. Multi-age is combining grades or combining ages for specific purposes too either developmentally or even because of a course or an inclination. Marie? 
So something we can think about on this is separating that automatic link between the term grade, which we tend to associate with sets of standards or certain kinds of expectations, and this idea of age. We're finding even now that that assumption starts to create a spread of up to two to three different year spans. I'll give you an example of that. My daughter is currently in what we would call fifth grade, but she's 10 years old and she's in a classroom with students who are 12 years old. Now, how does that happen? It happens at a lot of different times and because of a lot of different decisions. But I, all Heidi and I want you to um, suggest here or to challenge is that grade means age. And that if you're thinking about certain kinds of decisions for age appropriateness, then call it that. And if you're thinking about things because of grade structures or sets of standards, then call it that. Let's keep going. So this is, should be very familiar. This is an idea. This graphic is showing you how certain kinds of relationships between what we call grade levels plays out over years. And take a look at this idea. So in um, this K-12 education, we have this structure. This is showing from 2012 to 2013, all the way up through 2017 to 2018. And what you're looking at are these cohort grades, right? So from the first one, we have this idea of being in grade school, right? And whether that's one to eight, one to seven, and then this idea of junior high school. So I have two to eight, three to nine, four to 10. And then senior high school. So people, some people have in a terminology grades nine and 10 versus 11 and 12. And then you see that here with 11 and 12 at the end structure. This is a very familiar way of organizing students. Um, and because it's familiar, it doesn't involve adult learning. What we're suggesting is that that can be out of habit. There's no brain science that supports that this is the best way to organize learners. There's no long-term history that supports that this is best for learning all content areas or all granular skills or knowledge. So, by isolating or calibrating our terminology this way, we're inviting ourselves to say, hey, why are we doing it that way? That's one piece. And is there another way? Or is there a better way for us to think about grouping our learners? So multi-age grouping. Some people say, oh, yes, I have multi-age classrooms, as if that was an exceptional thing. Heidi and I tend to hear that in younger grade levels. They'll say, oh, I have... Um, let's say I have six, seven, eight, and nine-year-olds in the same classroom. We would call that a multi-age classroom. And it is exceptional in that younger area very often. It's not so exceptional to have the exact same multi-age grouping in a high school classroom. If I were in a band room or certain art rooms or certain kinds of electives, I would have that same four-year spread understood. It's completely natural that I would have it that way in a high school classroom. So this idea of thinking about multi-age grouping, we are saying, hey, when is that best? We're finding one opportunity is to think about it being best when it's a skill-based idea. All students learning granular math skills, if we all do it at the same time, we could move students up and down in terms of what they need in terms of math skills, if all the teachers are available at the exact same time, students could move in, up and down as needed and it wouldn't have to disrupt their whole schedule. That is multi-age grouping and it's perfect for granular math instruction, okay? Also another option is this idea of looping. For some reason, we've gotten it into our head that students have to transition every year to a whole new set of adults. Quite frankly, in terms of brain science, that doesn't make a lot of sense. The idea of 
teachers needing to spend two to three weeks to get to know their students and help them with their transition at each year could be seen as lost instructional time. We have examples of uh, countries and schools who allow a group of students to loop, in other words, spend two, three, four years with the same team of teachers, usually not one teacher, right? That's a little isolated, but a team of teachers so that students can make a relationship, they know who they're with, and that is multi-age grouping over years, over a time span. Heidi, would you like to add to that? Uh, just one thought. Let's think about that. That means that at the end of this year, if I have students for one year and suddenly the institution groups them, let's say I have third grade, they don't know who their teacher is going to be next year. Could be Sarah, could be Keenan, could be Marie. The first six weeks of that curriculum year and the map is getting to know the kids. But what if Marie and I have the same kids? We pick up where we left off. The notion here is in schools that have more continuity in terms of long-term teacher-student relations, kids gain more learning and they don't lose the 10, 15% where we try to make up for the gap of not only picking up where the kids come in, but getting to know them in the first place. So the research is really good on this notion. Thanks, Marie. So let's take a look at this. Let's hear from you for a second. We just want you to take a minute to share in the chat. How do you currently group your learners? Do you group them by grade? Do you group them by age span? Or do you have these multi-age groupings? Could you just take a minute to share in the chat how you currently experience this grouping? Okay, we hear your couple. We have grade level. Okay, yeah. So grade level, very often. If you want to make a distinction between is that grade level often done by age or can you have up to two or three years age-wise within one grade span? Yep. All right. Good. Heidi, there was one that had 11 and 12 together. They have two houses. Look at that. Yep. And 12, 11, 12. Well, most are grade level, and we, we understand that. We, we see that as a, a vestige of habit, kind of like we talked about old schedules. We're just used to running that way. But it's very interesting. If you look at your faculty, uh, I don't think you group your teachers by age group. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> and so one of the things we have to look at is not so much that multi-age is necessarily better, the question shouldn't be, which form should we fit in? But institutionally, let's step back. And are there some options we're not considering? What would be in the best interest of the specific students that we have? So, um, Marie, keep on rolling here. Sure. So thinking about this, um, size of institutional groupings. You and I don't have, as Heidi was mentioning before, we don't actually have control over those pieces. And we do understand the realities of location, budget, the idea of are, are we looking at a school that has a long waiting list? Do we end up in a lottery situation? We understand that. However, we can take that into our design consideration. Meaning you don't just throw your arms up in the air and say, oh, well, I have no control over it. I guess we'll just keep going the way we are. We really want to look at our data. Who are we as an institution? How are we grouping these students? What are our realities? And then use that into it to impact our instructional groupings. So what are some options? Institutional heterogeneous and homogeneous groupings. What does the research tell us? Real quick. Heterogeneous groupings tend to be favorable for the learner. The only time we're seeing that, that that is not the case is when students are in, let's say, the top 2% or an outlier 2% of the population. If you have students that represent an outlier 
you and I might need to consider homogeneous grouping situations to meet their needs because they are that extreme. Outside of that, across the board, heterogeneous groupings favor the learner. I'm not just saying that as a buzzword. It actually improves performance for all the learners involved in heterogeneous grouping. Let's own that for a second. Another thing we're seeing or a way to address that is the creation of houses. Many schools now are creating houses, teams, families, pick a feature. What it means is heterogeneous grouping across otherwise seemingly homo homogeneous grouping relationships. And uh, we've seen this very often in high school and middle school, but we've actually seen it. I kid you not, in reception through high school, um, really, and, and you can see it. Picture a day where all the students come in wearing a similar color or they're all embracing a consistent theme. And what happens is there's a relationship built. Connections are built. Students are able to have uh, these meaningful relationships that help them learn. And that allows you to make authentic learning experiences be able to come true because you have a larger audience or you have a larger area of connection and understanding. Um, we're see they're very reasonable to build. And there's something that you can even do if your buildings are not close to one another. You can create these connections. We're seeing schools do it now virtually. Let's keep going. Another way to make connections across these structures is with talent, interest, okay, uh, a focus. And these kinds of um, connections can also happen. I, I want to be clear here. It's not that a student now commits to an interest for the rest of their life. Can I say it like that? It doesn't mean I'm joining up and I'm going to be a doctor. So I am now on the doctor pathway. And Heidi and I have seen this get misunderstood across the board. But what it is, is it's showing pathways that have connections and choices. And what happens is I can be in that focus and then I can switch gears and be a part of another pathway that has connections and focuses. And this way, creating experiences. By having those experiences, I'm able to make choices about maybe whether I want to be a doctor or not. I have to tell you, I've met a lot of 20-year-olds who still have no idea what they want to be when they grow up. So for us to have this idea that students are going to pick a pathway early on and that's what they're going to be, I want to challenge that. But I certainly can say, hey, I'm interested in animals, or I'm interested, or I, I really like the way mathematics works. And so now this pathway opens up connections and options to uh, field study experiences, short term field study experiences, even a couple of weeks, right? And so by doing that, it opens me up to being a part of a cohort group that might have similar interests similar experiences, and then allows me to maybe get connected to getting certain credentials. Credentials can be earned in short periods of time. I don't have to commit my entire 13-year learning experience, but I could commit three months, and I could certainly earn a credential and complete a pathway in that kind of a time. And then again, picture it like a tree, right? It's like a, a, a research tree in development or, or a resource management tree. And it opens up into options. And by earning that credential, now I can earn any one of a number of additional credentials. Okay, this is very different from a locking pathway model. Uh, Heidi, did you want to add something to that? I do, just a thought. Um, as, as you're going through, I'm imagining that the the participants in the, in, the, in the webinar are going, oh, I can see the implications for um, curriculum. But I do have one important point because I think that, that this, this always touches a nerve in schools. In the discussion of homogeneous grouping, which is at your, at, you're absolutely right, we totally believe and know that it works better. There is this tendency to go like, yeah, but I've got kids who have these different needs. This is sort of um, waving the flag and saying, right, that's when we get into instructional grouping. Yeah. Homogeneous grouping doesn't work for a very simple reason. There's no such thing. 
I've never been in a homogeneous group in class in my life. I don't care if it's advanced placement, honors, physics. Kids have different skill abilities. If you were looking in math, some kids are, have a great predisposition towards geometric thinking. They have more difficult with trig. Or you have kids in writing who write elegant poetry. They can't write prose. So when we say there's, oh, we have the high level English students, I'm going, in what area? So we're not begging the question that it's all or nothing. We just want to say, when we predetermine a homogeneous group, we start to leave kids out instead of actually having kids demonstrate their needs. Marie, thank you. I know we're going to go to a chat now, I believe. That's exactly right. And so we want to hear from you in the group. Are there any institutional grouping formats that might benefit your students that maybe we've been talking about here? This idea of interest, this idea of a vertical grouping where they're all experiencing it at the same time. To Heidi's point, sometimes the very same students might be in the highest performing group for certain units, but then need additional support at another time in the year. And so it's a mythology. We're just calling shenanigans and saying it's a mythology to say I always have uh, the homogeneous grouping of choice at that time. So share with us, please, any institutional grouping formats that might benefit your students if we were to push this idea? Mother tongue days. I love it. We were just talking about with that with a group. Um, the the um, bilingual schools, right, where they acknowledge two um, primary languages. But usually one group is kind of the academic instructional language. And then there's this, it's just so difficult to have equal time to whatever the second language is. And so having full days or even a full week where everyone see, speaks that other language, uh, including the announcements and all the teachers, it really is something to kind of get that equality. Love it. Student interest, just survey the kids. You know, one thing, um, Alice and the last two, Alice and Mallory, um, and the last one, it looks like uh, Idessa Rowe, both said something about student interest. Here's something interesting. There's something almost dismissive when a student pursues a task that's just something they're interested in, and it's not nurtured. A pathway is saying, we will help you work on this over time. How often do we look at our curriculum maps and look at how could we help sustain student interest in the young children too, over the course vertically over several years, as opposed to this is special, you get to study something you're interested in, now we're done. So imagine going back, if we were in a team, the four of us had a house in terms of a student grouping for three years, think what we could do with that student interest and, and support it, thank you. Okay, let's take a look. Hmm, oh, that's real interesting. Last one, Vanessa, I like that one. Mm -hmm. um, so Keenan. Hi, Keenan. Hello. <laughs> uh, just wanted to build off of that. And um, there's just a quick little example I wanted to highlight of how um, we can leverage chalk to potentially accommodate different flexible options when you're thinking about these um, different ways you could group at an institutional level. Um, kind of building a bit off the pathway idea. Um, and if there's anything the, the two of you want to add, please do feel free to chime in. But um, one of the examples I wanted to highlight here is when you're building your maps, and a lot of the times it is kind of structured a little bit more, maybe if you want to say in a traditional sense where you'll see this quite frequently working with districts, they'll have them by grade level. But did want to highlight that there are a lot of different options of how you want to structure that. And one of the other things that you could potentially do is highlighting this notion of pathways. Like I, I just kind of what you were just talking about, Marie, is kind of interesting. Uh, made me think a lot about like my experience when I was going through high school. Um, when you talk about being 20 and not knowing we were <laughs> probably a little bit older, I still didn't know. But anyway, um, going through the courses, like when you're pulling together and building out your curriculum, there are ways that you can tag or, or basically identify potential pathways within the courses that may exist that may spur ideas of how you may want to restructure these or, or just kind of 
draw things out that you can maybe even talk with students about or as professionals as a group talk about. So like if I, I just threw one in here for healthcare and I, I tagged it on a few different maps that may be relevant, but these aren't necessarily to your point saying like, okay, like if you're gonna go to healthcare, you're just gonna take all these courses and then you're locked in. Um, like a good example might be something that spans multiple. So sorry, my things in the way here, but I, I have very high level here, but you could also see how a given course may be tagged with a couple of different options. So that as a student, you might be able to see by going in a direction, maybe you started in healthcare, kind of open that door to also realizing maybe this is related to journalism that I might also be interested in. And you can kind of learn more about those opportunities, potentially use this as a launching point as a teacher, if you're looking for ideas of how you can build out content for that map, you can see all the different potential pathways this is linked to and use that to help maybe drive different professional groups. So just wanted to highlight the flexible options that are available to you on the, when you're building out your curriculum in an environment like this is it can really open up those um, different ways you can look at the courses you maybe kind of think of as more traditional. So uh, with that, just wanted to hand it back over to Marie, I believe. <laughs> well, it's me. Um, oh, it's Heidi, sorry. It's Wait. Heidi, but I'm gonna click the thing here. There you go, yeah. You know, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want to get at something you just did. It gave me an idea. Um, what I'm thinking about, if you can go back, if that's possible. Sure, I um, can. Hold on. Thank you. Um, here's a thought. What you said was, I thought, really got, got my attention. Because, for example, the two of us are working right now with a district that's about to launch on Pathways. A couple of them, actually, who are thinking about it. Right now, I the way it was described... What I'm hearing you say is, as I go through, I could tag, and I totally understand how you do that, courses, and I could go, oh, this could be part of a healthcare tag, or a communications tag, or STEM, or whatever. But one could also be very proactive and say, rather than just each teacher doing this, we are going to comb through as a faculty, and we're going to begin to be very proactive about finding programs and beginning to deliberately create tags and pathways. We could even have a tag that was a pathway. We could say pathway colon STEM or something like that, right? So mm -hmm. it wouldn't just be here's something that relates in general. It could be something where you could build a pathway very elegantly and simply by using the tagging system with deliberation or color coded. Just a thought. Anyway, I got excited about that. Okay, Marie, do you like it? <laughs> I do. Let's go. So what we're looking at now is we're now making a shift. Marie and I were laying out institutional grouping. Now we're looking at that individual teacher choice that you make all the time. It, it doesn't matter what day it is. You're always choosing how you group your kids or keeping them all as a whole class, which is also a choice. And one of the things we think is real important is to step back and be very deliberate about the purpose, the intention behind the grouping, as opposed, again, working on habit. One of the things that you have to consider is whether the members of the group are voluntary. Students self-select to join a group or if it's teacher determined and there's value absolutely in both. You've got to think about who's in the group. You know your kids better than anybody. There's certain personalities, obviously, you consider that you want together or you don't. You have to make a determination about whether it's a long-term group that goes through the year for sustained reasons or something more short-term, ad hoc, skill-based. We have to also consider facilitation of a group. There's research that came out of University of Southern Connecticut many years ago on early childhood grouping. And the basic notion was starting in pre-KK, you can get kids to begin to function in groups in, in the biggest number is a threesome if they have a short-term time task. But you go past three or four minutes with a group of four-year-olds, good luck, Charlie. I mean, it's a problem. So what we realize is there's considerations developmentally, but here's the other thing. If they never have a chance to learn how to function and carry out a task, then they become entirely teacher-dependent on how we begin to wean them to that. We also need to work with kids on working independently. That is, that is a choice, as we'll get into. And then one of our favorite areas to get into are numbers, the actual numbers in a group. There's lots of different purposes. You can group for skill needs. 
both in terms of common and mixed. You can do it for their competence, mixed again or similar. Think about a, a tennis coach who might put all, this, all the kids on the team who need to work on their backhand together, but for other purposes mixes them as they go into, into uh, a practice play. Or mixed roles, or when we look at the notion of project-based learning how we might have students put together instructionally so we can have various roles that students carry out. We look at instructional grouping in terms of timing and readiness. When do we group them in the course of their progress? Sometimes when we introduce a concept, we want them together initially, and we might group and regroup. We also might think about instructional grouping for a think tank, letting kids deliberate, come up with ideas, solve problems together on their interests for social interaction, for safety purposes. We want to teach them about civil discourse, and don't we all need that more than ever these days? And how do we, how do we organize students so they learn to listen to one another respectfully? Sometimes we have routine groups. Purposeful routines is very different than groups that run on habit. Ad hoc groups, and also anchor groups, groups that are real important. Perhaps there's for the first semester, in a um, middle school and eighth grade English, there's a core writing anchor group where students are going to do peer reviews of their papers through the course of the first semester. It saves you time. They work well. They're high functioning. But you want to break them up at some point or add talk talk groups in the moment. Thanks, Marie. No, and just as we're moving into the next slide, these are the kinds of things that we would expect to show up in our planning. These are timely decisions when I'm implementing my curriculum instructionally. So Thank you, there's, Heidi. A lot of, there's a lot of work that's gone into uh, numbers, not just for children, but for adults. And it's one of the most fascinating things to study. And uh, some of that work occurred a number of years ago, for example, in automobile factories, how many people in a line should be together? Or what's the best functioning number, say, in a marketing team in business? that. The study on numbers suggests that the actual numbers in the group make a big difference on its success. And if you could go back, please. I apologize. That's uh, quite all right. Um, if it, it, it's sort of fascinating to me. <laughs> well, honestly, this happens all the time. I'll be with a teacher who's designed a beautiful lesson or activity. It doesn't work. And I, I just go, because of this training on numbers, I'll go, well, maybe the groups were too big or they were too small. Or did you look at who you put together? Because the task itself was great, but it wasn't a target match with the numbers. So we're going to take a look at these and why you would choose each of these. I'm not going to read through the list. We're going to go into them for just a moment. And then we're going to have some fun looking at how this translates into planning with chalk. Okay, next slide, please. So one of the most important notions is when do kids work alone? The power of one. And learning how to count on yourself. Learning how to pace yourself taking advantage of the notion of personal reflection. If I want my kids to reflect on their own performance, they need to be able to do this themselves. It also has to do with this idea of confronting my competence and being able to wrestle with how to improve my skill. We gave a lot of examples. Um, we were talking about assessment, I think, in some of our earlier uh, webinars with you at Chalk. And this idea of three tiers and that the idea of drill and practice is so that I can take a look at what to do differently. I practice on my own. Maybe I'm taking foul shots, but I'm confronting my competence. I do it on my own. I have my own breakthrough and I begin to thrive. And there's something about that critical point. When you give a national or state or provincial examination, the kids are taking it alone. So part of it is to really work with the student to be able to develop their inner self, to take creative risks, and they need to be personally a stakeholder in tasks, as opposed to having school be something that's done to them. Next slide, please. So as we look at this idea of the importance of working solo, ultimately, each learner is on their own, their own journey. They're developing confidence, fascination, curiosity, and interest is unique to the individual, as unique as a thumbprint, the, the things that fascinate a child are unique to them. Marie? So the idea here is um, thinking about um, how students are organizing their own learning, how they're even aware of what their interests are. 
There was uh, one person who we worked with uh, out of New York called the Gen Y guy. And he talked a lot about exposure to ideas about what fascinates someone early in their career, not waiting till they're in high school, not waiting till they're in college, but letting them explore them over short periods of time to help them kind of go, oh, well, there's something I can never do or don't want to do, right? But this idea of really having the learning journey not be the industrial model. It's not mass production and interchangeable parts. Doesn't matter what teacher you get, it'll all work out. This idea of an individual journey and framing it that way, thinking about it that way, and then communicating it to the, the learner that way. Okay, so let's think about pairs, okay, the dyads. Uh, there was a lot of work done by Logan and King. Uh, they called it uh, tribal leadership, okay? But it's really also, it could be called tribal learning if you wanted. The idea of how do we interact best and how do we move forward best from wherever it is that we need. Pairs, dyads, hold each other accountable. So when a student is in a situation where they're going, oh, I am not good at that. I'd like to be good at that. If they're in their own head that way, a dyad is really the optimal learning environment for that because it can be a focused communication. I can't disappear into the group. I can't have this idea of just appealing to or appeasing whatever it is the task is. So this idea of a dyad is so powerful if you have students who need to close a gap. And second, they can actually do parallel work. They can be at very different levels and both still succeed. So if you're dealing with heterogeneous grouping, dyads can be one of your powerhouse small grouping tools to use. Okay, now let's think about trios and quartets. If you have students, oh yes, Heidi? No, that's okay. That's all right. Okay. I had it down as mine, but that's okay. <laughs> well, it is, go, go, go. I was just on a run. All right, let me start, because I'm so into it. Okay, so here's the idea of trios is when students are saying, oh, I'm so good at this. Please don't make me work with them, right? Or this idea of maybe people are struggling, but when you are having students who are in individual moments of excellence, putting them together in trios and quartets, it's like creating little groups of the Avengers, right? You give them a task that's too hard for any one student to do, and now you're creating genuine collaboration, whereas the dyads were genuine purposeful accountability, trios and quartets can solve problems that are too big for one student to do. It's so exciting. Go ahead, Heidi. Sorry, no, I had to get I, that up. I, I, the Avengers got me. That was right. Really <laughs> um, I think the, the key thing is to think of the phrase I've often heard is pairs are more like confessionals. They're more intimate. They're more personal. And so sometimes, in fact, when a teacher says, well, I put these two kids together to solve this problem, I'm going, this isn't going to go very far. They're going to start to be either self-revealing or pull off. Whereas trios and quartets are just the right size to deal with a specific task. Thanks, Marie. Let's keep her rolling. All right. When you get into larger groups, the size of five or eight, and that's no mistake that whenever you go to uh, a celebration, right, they have those large circular round tables and sets of five and eight. There's something really wonderful about the group five and eight for discussion. People get a turn, people can take a break. It's not exhaustive, right? <clears throat> but it, you get this wonderful spectrum of points of view, opinions. Um, it can be formal or informal because you can run it as a panel or you can run it as just an informal discussion, maybe something like a lit circle. Um, and what's really nice about these is you don't have to come to a conclusion. It's about exploring perspective. It's about understanding and, and stretching point of view. And usually you can connect it to a reflection. I'm not looking to get to a point of consensus when I'm with this large of a group, okay? That's going to be kind of tricky. But when you're dealing with something where it's about point of view, then this is the optimal group session to have that happen. 
When you get to 12, you're at a quorum. You are at something where you can do a small group for direct instruction. I can have something where I can then create a task and then break it up into smaller groups, all right? What's nice about a group of 12 is you still have what's technically described as a team. So you can have a sense of identity. This is where they can still have a sense of a house and dress in the same colors, right? Um, identity is not lost here. When we talk about decision-making in a group of 12, you may not hit consensus, but you can hit a decision. That's very important to note in a group of 12. Whereas when you get to whole class, depending on how large your classes are, and we know your spectrum can go from anywhere from 20 to as many as 100 in a class, now identity can be lost. I might need to set up organizational structures for that. Um, the idea here is though, now because identity is lost and I'm not appealing to that decision-making or problem solving, you can create structures for preserving membership or citizenship in a classroom. You can create a commons. This is very important for sustainable thinking, right? Sustainability learning. What is in the commons? What are the rules and protocols for a commons? What is it where maybe I'm in the group of my, my quorum or a smaller group? And what are the protocols for that? It is very important for students to learn how to understand their identity and that identity as membership or citizenship within a larger group. And that's what a whole class situation can do. <clears throat> of course, once we've developed that in our younger learners, really connecting them to how that works as a telescope, right? Myself, my family, my classroom, my school, my district, my community, local, the idea of it being whether it's state or province or a national relationship, uh, we'll go global. Hey, I'll go interstellar if you're willing to go there as well. But this idea that it's a telescope and that that idea of citizenship, the relationship of the individual to the greater community is one that is a lifelong experience. And your curriculum should reflect that. All right. Hi. Hey, Keenan. Hey. <laughs> um, so really quickly, I wanted to show a couple of different examples of uh, these different options that you may have when you're looking at different instructional groupings. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit on the chalk side. So for those of you who may have been in earlier presentations, uh, you may know that we have kind of two big components of what chalk offers. The first one we've seen here is our curriculum side. It's uh, obviously looking at the curriculum mapping aspect. We also do have uh, some functionality based a little bit more to, uh, or geared more rather towards the lesson planning or instructional planning uh, side of things. So here we're just looking at an example of our lesson planner plan board. It's our week that we've laid out here. Um, this schedule is very customized based on what we want to establish for ourselves. So if you ever did need to change this, I know we talked a little bit more about this in the last session, but as changes are needing to be made to your schedule, those are quite easily to adapt. So if this math class is gonna be a little longer on Wednesday here, we can adjust that quite easily, making those changes on the fly as we're working through. And we can see those changes taking place directly in our planner here. One of the things I really wanted to highlight based on what we were just talking about is if you're planning instruction with your classroom and you're wanting to build a uh, specific activity that's maybe lending itself more to smaller groups or if you're doing those individuals or, or whatever it might be, uh, it's very feasible and possible to set up multiple options when you're creating your lessons. So when you're coming in to populate your content, based on the type of instruction that you're planning to deliver, you can choose the relevant template for yourself. So if we go with the small group example, uh, and you may even want to be more specific with that based on what we were just discussing, but when you're applying that to your class here, you can see how it'll populate that template in for you. And then based on what's in here, you have that starting point for yourself. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel. And speaking of which, in addition to having those kind of structured templates for yourself, you also have access to resources that maybe from yourself in the past or that your colleagues have shared with you, maybe that you found online. Uh, and you can pull those in here and modify those for yourself based on the needs of, of the students you're working with here. So if I come in here and I'm looking for a particular resource and I wanted to pull that into this 
So I'm going to drop it on my math class. I'm going to append it into that template that I've structured. So now I have all these pieces in one place and I can really build it to make my own. So I had that template down below. I've now added these resources and I can really structure that a lesson around all those pieces for me. Uh, there's a lot of other cool things I can show you here, but I know I want to be mindful of the time. Just keep in mind you have access to this. There's a mobile version of it as well. And with that, I'll hand it back to Heidi and Marie. Thank you. Keenan, one important point. You could go in is what I'm hearing you say. And if I really want to be on my game, I could literally create a drop down that said solo cares yeah. three to four, which would make me be more vigilant about that. Couldn't I also say if I'm a second grade teacher, the bluebirds or you know, whatever you call them, or the hawks, whatever your predisposition is. But the point here is you can set this up not to be just broadly generic. But highly strategic. I think that's super. A wonderful flexibility there. Let's keep rolling here. So we're now moving forward. We're looking at the structural nest and we're going to be looking at how we group students, but we want to look at corresponding professional grouping patterns. So as we proceed, we can go to the next one. Thank you. What we're really saying now is if we have grouped our students in different ways, how might we group our professionals? And what we know um, is that when we group professional, this is an apt picture. I think most of us feel like we're dropping right now in space, hopefully holding hands, is we want to expand affiliations. We know that adults thrive in, in situations where they're not just pigeonholed into one. So what we're looking at is how do we expand beyond perhaps maybe I'm a third grade teacher or I'm a high school math teacher. There's two affiliations, high school and math but begin to look at the roles and talents that we can build on. Next, please. So with that in mind, again, there's institutional personnel configurations and instructional as well. So you can be a teacher, you'll be on a teacher team, administrator, a coach, an advisor, a counselor. And coaches, by the way, are not obviously just in athletics, it could be instructional, it could be a, a mentor or a guide for a cohort or a pathway model. It could be support staff, special designation teachers, aides, or a field guide, or among many of the possible categories. These can be expanded as well. Next, please. So these are common. You all can see these. Um, you're used to these. That most of the time, if we look at the way teachers are grouped, they tend to be with the group they're scheduled to be with. Or they're, or they're set up according to the design of the grouping of the kids. Hence, if I am a second grade teacher in a self-container, a self-contained classroom, I'm pretty much working alone. Whereas if Marie and I have a looped group of kids ages six through eight for two to three years, we now have a very different type of affiliation and grouping pattern. So there's lots of ways of working. There's a reason, say, for departments, but there's also a need for interdisciplinary teams, not just to do wonderful units together, but in fact, to take a look at how writing's working across freshman year. Or there's other grouping patterns that deal with not just after school, but off campus or internship type of placements. Keep, let's keep rolling. So something that would build off of that going with what Heidi just talked about in terms of departments or this idea of um, interdisciplinary, we have some schools now rewriting the teacher job description to be that I am an educator. So we have high school teachers working with um, elementary teacher teams for certain sections of units or doing certain kinds of concept building. And so now that's a new affiliation that they can have. And it's incredibly powerful for really, oops, I, I feel like we just skipped a chat. I was building up toward it. There it is. <laughs> so what we want you to do very quickly, we're very mindful of time. But really taking this stretch and saying, do I identify as just one grade level or one discipline? Or is, is there an opportunity for me to have multiple affiliations? Could you just brainstorm, well, seriously, one or two faculty groupings that you would like to see in your school as a challenge, right? We know the stereotypical ones. We got that. 
What else could we have? We, we teach in one school in California where all the teachers get one course where they get to teach anything they want, any kind of interest that they want. It's usually done after school. They can teach. Uh, it has You don't need a certification in it in terms of a disciplinary certification. What would that look like in your school? Or having these affiliations change? Oh, okay, a STEAM team. Excellent. Christine, thanks for getting us started. Let's just brainstorm these. Let's take a minute. And that could be STEAM, STREAM, STREAM, depending on how many disciplines you want to get in there. Just saying. Yep, social emotional learning. Thank you, Kate. Okay, we're going to get a couple of more there. Excellent. City as our campus. Love it. Interdisciplinary groupings, transdisciplinary groupings. What we've learned here is that the power of these teaching teams and how we can cross pollinate our expertise, our talents, our interests um, is absolutely a game changer when it comes to thinking about maximizing the efficacy of our, of our schools. And so we wanna really think about what these teams can look like. And that pigeonholing us too tightly is the industrial model. And when we think of us more as a partnership model, it can start opening some doors. One way, one affiliation we can have is absolutely curricular. OK, and what we've understood about curriculums is that um, can I say it like this? The world is not disciplinary, meaning no matter how you slice and dice this, if you look out your window, it's not disciplinary. But I can choose to develop a lens in the brain for how to look outside my window. I could look outside my window, which happens to be very snowy right now, for those of you wondering, speaking to you from New Jersey, I could look at that snowy field as a poet. But I could look at that snowy field as a scientist. I could look at that snowy field as a mathematician. But when we think about ourselves as educators, there's power in understanding the development of that lens, but it's limiting. And so these affiliations can then be connected. They have to be connected at some point, whether that's as an assessment or as a learning experience, a field study, a case study. This is one entryway. Another one, though, is by teaching talent. This is a favorite of Heidi's and I, because when we started working with space, we said, why is it we're expecting teachers to be all things at all times? Some teachers are just better at giving a lecture. They have the timing down. They have the humor. They understand the pace and the structure of it. And quite frankly, if you're a talented lecturer, it doesn't matter the content area. If I give you all the information on it, you can run a lecture on it. The same thing's true for an inquiry event. Some teachers are going, I just don't get the pacing of an inquiry event. I keep wanting to give the kids the answers. Yet other teachers are like, oh, I, it's like second nature to have those kinds of inquiry questions again. So I could run an inquiry event in any topic area. So having teachers then kind of looking at the curriculum in a different way. If we have talents, just strong talents, does it matter where we are able to make those bloom for the students? We suggest, no, go right ahead. But it's a different kind of grouping. Another one could be by subject area, okay? Some of us are experts in that. In fact, we're seeing, a, if you just check the news right now, we're seeing this influx of teachers now where teaching is their second and third career. They are experts in their fields. They may not be the strongest as teachers in terms of the science and art of teaching, but they know their subject. How could we leverage those talents and bring them into a, a group of teachers then to be strengthened? Again, having them in isolation, I'm not feeling like that's the way to go. Maybe there's another way. 
We mentioned it earlier. It's worth saying again, interdisciplinary. I'm sitting with the guru, Heidi. Want to talk a little bit about this one? Well, um, I don't know if the guru thing, but I, I will say that um, a couple things. First, um, a lot of, uh, you know, people get certified in a discipline, but that doesn't mean they're not aware of other subjects. You know, it's not like if you measured in math, all I can do is talk in numbers. Just don't ask me to use words. And conversely, all elementary teachers, almost without exception, have to be inherently interdisciplinary in looking for the connections. So I think the possibilities are, are just terrific. But I also think, and a couple of people have made comments here, we often tend to go with clusters like humanities and STEM, where I think there's other real interesting possibilities to, to cross-reference that. Next slide, please. Um, along those lines, um, we want mentors. We want to develop um, uh, relationships where, where, where students turn to their teachers to help guide them on projects over the long haul. Maybe the teacher doesn't know a lot about what the student's working on, but they can also um, also be able to provide guidance on just how to complete a task or the like. Um, I've seen some great projects that way. Uh, one of the schools up uh, where I live, uh, just outside of Manhattan, I live in Westchester County, and one of the middle schools did a, a, an Adopt-A-Town project where once a month the kids were in groups with a different teacher than they had usually for the regular program, and that person just met them at lunch to help them learn about how to adopt a town and learn about it, how to be a researcher. And it gave a fresh perspective for the teacher and for the kids. Next one, please. And then, of course, pathways. We've talked a lot about that, and so don't want to belabor it. But the idea is to cluster personnel and also to bring outside people to the faculty. So the faculty isn't just who's in the building, but the expertise that we can find um, uh, as well in the community. I also think that sometimes we ought to think about students as part of our personnel too. That they can be a task force that it supports and helps um, in, 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 in studies and in projects. Next slide, please. So one of the other uh, sort of interesting ideas is in the performance field. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of teachers are really maybe have an academic subject and they also work in an area where there's performance involved. And I think a lot of times we think of that as a one-way deal. So for example, I might be, to be honest with you, might be I'm a social studies teacher and I also coach a sport. But I think the reverse can occur. That one of the one of the talented things, one of the things we have, for example, is you might have a really terrific drama coach who could really do a lot to help in a classroom where say it's in an academic subject, I don't care whether it's science or it's English to bring that person in to assist in helping kids share their presentations, to work in a more cohesive way. Too often we do a one-way street on the way we configure personnel and talent. Next slide, please. Also, obviously, interest. You see a lot of this in clubs, for example. But there's also interest, if, if you look at your curriculum maps, I'm thinking, Keenan, if I were able to look at a curriculum map in chalk, and I had a real keen interest, let's say, uh, um, in, a, in a part of the world where maybe I'd lived for a number of years. Say I'd lived in China or something. And I'm looking and I go, wow, they're studying that in fifth grade. They're studying that in eighth grade. We should, we should, we have our own uh, visiting experts within our own building that we can use in a much more cross-referenced way. Obviously, supporting kids in their interests, but it's also taking advantage of the human capital that we have to um, create the, the community that we're after. And then finally, global teams. And we really love this. This is the idea of, I really think schools should have sister schools, partners with faculties. We've had the good fortune of working with lots of international groups. We're seeing people from all over the world and a few of you I know, as well as Marie. It's so fun to see your names pop up. What is so dynamic and exciting is putting minds together to have your students meet with kids in other places, but also for a faculty, find out something like, you are the country, you are the countries that really developed reading recovery, Australia, New Zealand. I want to work with some teachers who made that happen. Let's help my school. That it's not only to help and create with the kids, but to create the work as, as professionals. So Keenan, it's all yours. Thanks for that. And yeah, I, I really like that idea that you brought up of like having interest in it. I always thought it was like a really 
just my experience in school, a cool event when like a teacher that like you've only seen in the hallways and they come in and it's almost just like, it just makes that day special, you know, like seeing that interest come in from, from within the building and it's someone you're, you're familiar with and you get to go have those conversations with them after. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight on the curriculum side, so we're kind of switching back uh, to the curriculum side of chalk here uh, and really just highlighting how it's very much established as a collaborative environment. So all those different potential opportunities of how you might work uh, with other teachers, other professionals, um, you do all have that opportunity to jump in and create all that in one centralized environment here. So you're not limited by what building you're in, what grade levels you teach, what subject areas that you specialize in. You really can contribute across the board here. Uh, and just to give you a quick example of that. So in this um, map here we're looking at, so it's just an, at an elementary grade level, we're looking at geometry. If you maybe were having a conversation with the teacher and had a good idea of how you could potentially maybe incorporate road signs as an alternative activity that you could um, do in this unit. So instead of just kind of talking about it and then having to make later plans of how you can get them those resources, you can actually jump right into the environment here and just put those in for them so that they're easily accessible right in the curriculum map. So we can just drop that in, um, in addition to any resources. So if you have PowerPoint presentations, PDFs, whatever you need to execute on that, just throw it in there. And even further to that, you can actually just kind of let them know once it's in there. So you can just quickly tag them, let them know. Um, I've added those resources. Uh, talking about and you can comment that so that'll let them know they can actually jump in and if you're in an environment where maybe you're working synchronously and you're both kind of wanting to look at this at the same time they could actually come in in real time and start working through this tweaking it as they needed to so just really wanted to highlight the collaborative nature of how this works uh, when you've got your content established in chalk here thanks keenan So the idea here, and thank you, Keenan. Um, I think it's one of the interconnection points that uh, Heidi and I always talk about when we talk about the structured nest. And it's the idea that if I'm going to work through um, adjusting how I'm grouping my learners, and now I'm gonna start thinking about how I'm adjusting, how I'm grouping my professional members of my community, teachers and staff, then I end up interacting with all of the elements, time and space. And so we don't just rip the bandaid off. This is not bold moves are not reckless, right? So one of the things we end up talking about is maybe I can do this for short periods of time. Keenan, you mentioned it. Maybe it's a teacher coming in as a guest speaker for maybe one or two days or a, a section of time for a particular unit. I could do things even for longer periods of time. Maybe it is for a whole unit. Maybe I'm located in a different space. Maybe I'm networking with a local university and I have interns from the university operating as mentors to small groups of my students. Um, the idea here is grouping is flexible. That's one of the things that's so super cool about it. And I'm able to then think about all the different ways or different periods of time. Um, Sally, you had asked a question earlier about pathways because we use the term pathways. And that can be, um, you mentioned the uh, career pathways in the United States. I apologize. And one of the things that that uh, the CTE programs, career and technical education programs, use the term pathways. We are not talking about that, although certainly you could take material from that um, or any of the alternative high school programs, but those are pretty much you're locked in. So I just wanted to be clear about that as a, a question that was out there. So um, the idea about groupings, whether it's for short term, or for long term, is that we really need to think about the purpose and that we're stating it clearly to the learner and to the families. This is very important. The other idea is that we are matching it to personnel and that there's a clear line of communication. Uh, who's giving the feedback? How is this going to be connected in terms of grading? What does this mean in terms of accountability or assignments? 
And then this idea of matching uh, the teacher talent and skill to whatever the situation in terms of need. What Heidi was talking about, could I bring in someone who makes presentations, that's a major part of their curriculum, when presentations might be a mild part of an assessment in my classroom? And then last but not least, this idea of building teams that creates a sense of collaboration for our faculty, and in many cases, with the students, um, that that element cannot be understated. Oh, yes. Sorry, I apologize, Heidi. No, this is all yours. Oh, okay. Fantastic. So when I'm thinking about how to connect my grouping of students to that grouping of adults, you could actually create a, you, you could cross-reference everything we said at the beginning of this session with everything we said at this end of this section, and they can are, uh, operate um, in any combination. I could have grade level grouping and that multi-age grouping we talked about in the interdisciplinary, the pathway model, not the locked in version. And then we talk about quest based. Heidi and I wrote about questing. And then again, we wrote about it with Allison and Zamuda and Mike Fisher. Um, and that can be anything from a teacher led quest or facilitated quest all the way to field study experiences to all those teacher configurations. I could have a classroom teacher or a team of teachers who are looping with a group. Uh, we work with a group in Connecticut who is very clear about their teacher teams within grade levels and age spans, but then they have super groups. So let's say I'm an eighth grade teacher. I can have super eights, meaning I have students who are eighth graders that are more than three years older than all my other eighth graders who are at that level. And the same thing is true for super 12s. I could have interdisciplinary teams or these cohort coaches, people who come in and out of teams, move between teams, creating collaboration and connection, um, and then advisors. But that could also be advisors or mentors with organizations outside of our group. Heidi mentioned sister schools. The idea here is documenting that communication, having something that creates a structure that your teams can return to. And that takes us back to our learning targets, the idea of what we've been working through for our structured nest. This idea of curriculum apps and supporting all different kinds of instructional grouping with our curriculum, or the idea of instructional techniques that can uh, increase the achievement quickly, right? We, talk, we talked about things that you could be doing immediately. You don't need to wait for your institution to change something. It's something you could change just with your instructional choices. Or this idea of what are those possibilities? Are there different ways of grouping our teams? And then what kinds of support or what kinds of impacts we could have to help our institution embrace contemporary institutional groupings beyond what we have as habit today? Any other pieces on that, Heidi, before I go into the closure of that? I know, right? I feel a little sad that we're coming to the end of our structured nest, though. <laughs> right? Like, let's just like, take a quick moment. We had this idea of like, we were talking about space and furniture and, and what we could do physically. And then we were like, hey, time, remember that? And we were talking about how we would interact with time and block scheduling and being flexible. And everyone always says, oh, Marie, I'd love to do that schedule, but who'd be in charge of the kids when they were working on those self-navigation tools, right? And that gets into the grouping of adults. <clears throat> One thing I'd love to share just at this end is that we start to see a, a hierarchy of adults in our schools Having your master teachers do everything from attendance to plant and safety uh, all the way down to every level of just supervision really does tax their minutes. And so we end up bringing in other people into our organization so that maybe I might have a learning suite. I want you to just picture those learning suites Heidi and I talked about, oh, so long ago. And maybe I have volunteers or people who are really good at the social emotional learning pieces and readiness pieces that are in charge of plant and safety and attendance. While master teachers who are good at instructional grouping choices are working on their curriculums that way. It's a different way of thinking about who's in our school and how it runs. 
which brings us to our Q&A. Sarah, I'm looking at you. How are we doing on those questions? We're and good. I just want to thank you and Keenan for <laughs> allowing Heidi and I to be a part of this program and this process. It really was a lot of fun to talk about the structured nest. Well, you know, we're always thrilled to have you guys. You provide so much incredible insight, um, both, I mean, for the two of us, like Keenan and I, we both learned so much during these webinars, but we know that everyone else tuning in does as well, whether, you know, you're watching live with us now or, or on the recording later on. Um, we did get a question early on. I believe you touched on it a little bit, Marie, earlier, but um, Sally Burnett was asking, do, we, do you use or reference the U.S. National Career Pathways at all? Right, and that is a direct reference to those CTE or career and technical education programs. And in the US, those schools have different kinds of structures uh, and they connect to all kinds of things like alternative high school structures and they have their own curriculums um, and their own certifications actually. Um, so it is a little different from what Heidi and I are talking about in terms of intermittent pathways within any curriculum design. We wouldn't want you to have to create an alternative high school or create a different certification for a pathway. Yeah, think of it as a menu that there's exactly. a, a lot of different ways to support aspirations and skills. And you know, I, my, my sense is that eventually we're going to see a big shift. So the idea is not every student needs to go on to post-secondary college, some will. There'll be adaptations in colleges. Colleges actually could use, are looking at credentialing too, by the way. So we'll, we'll, I think we're going to see this concept play out. I see some other questions, Sarah. Yeah, Laura had two great ones here. I think we'll have to answer both of them. <laughs> um, yeah. So first up, she said, uh, would you still recommend heterogeneous grouping for teachers? So um, teaching talent, so pairing some who are stronger in a specific talent with others who can grow in that area, as an example. Hmm. I think multiple affiliations means that there's different ways we maximize adult capability. Um, I think right now what we have is actually, I've never thought about it before. Laura, wherever you are, you've really got me. That was really a great question because in a sense, we box a teacher in by saying, you're a second grade teacher, you know second grade. Whereas in fact, uh, the most second grade teachers I know have taught a lot of different grades and that we actually should be maximizing insight beyond that particular label. Or I'm a math high school teacher, whereas I might be a math high school teacher who has, uh, who, who teach, who sings opera. I remember that at my, when my kids were in high school. That's actually the truth. And you know, he, he, he'd come in and he'd come in and he'd sing in the music class. You know, we shouldn't, you know, it almost is like stereotyping is what happens. And what we want to do is break out of that. Yeah, I would, I would second that and just say, we're not suggesting one type of grouping. What we're suggesting is multiple opportunities for different kinds of grouping in a given day, in a given uh, year, um, that that's going to be the strongest. Great. And then her other question um, was, any tips for faculty grouping in small schools? She says they have seven teachers who are often the only subject area teachers that they have there. Right. I love small schools where they say we're like a family. And I'm like, is that a functional or dysfunctional family? <laughs> and so I think that we should be sensitive, right? Like in these small schools, um, you know how we do it with kids and we say, Heidi mentioned anchor groups or standing groups with your students. We overuse ability grouping with our kids, right? And so we say things like, well, just survey the kids and maybe we have yellow grouping where we group them by who likes certain kinds of pets or even non-pets or, or maybe social emotional grouping, who they feel safe with, who, by the way, is not always their friends, right? So really thinking about where's their healthiest ability to communicate. We can do that with adults too. What's so wrong with surveying our faculty, getting to know who they are? And sometimes we group them by their disciplines and sometimes we group them by where we think they're going to be able to communicate and collaborate best or bloom with their, um, their interests or their abilities. And so I would really treat, especially a small school, 
school with the same science that Carol Ann Tomlinson put on the table when she said, let's think about how we're picking our groupings. And it would really depend on the purpose. I would go right back to, are we looking at maybe creating an interdisciplinary project opportunity? Or are we looking to create some uh, different kinds of schedules? And so I'm looking for different ways of having the teachers interact with the students while they're um, maybe working on independent projects or giving feedback. These are opportunities to group adults differently. Heidi, you want to add to that? I do. I think that the problem is when we have a small school and we're pretending we're like a big school and stretching ourselves, as opposed to saying, this is our tribe and we need to step back and look at different possibilities internally that we might look at the four structures. This is a great opportunity for orchestration. Maybe, in fact, we do better if we paired up. And although someone may have a subject matter credential, teaming occurs all the time. Another thing is to look out and to invite not only obviously virtual participation, but um, other sister schools. Um, I've, got, I've got a school, I'm thinking of two schools right now in St. Louis that are really small, teacher per grade level, K through six and they're paired. We often do PD together. So the teachers between the two schools interact with one another and are actually sharing. By the way, you know who those schools are, Keenan, because they both use chalk. <laughs> and in fact, they're now, they, they share the same maps and look at each other's work. So there's an interesting point. That's a nice plus for chalk, but <laughs> it's that they're sister schools, so to speak, because they share the same platform too and can look at each other's work. Anyway, thank you. Um, but I think that I think that pretty much says it. Is there another question? I just thought I saw something. Yes, one just popped up. I think we'll answer this one and then wrap things up. So um, Beth Friedman asks your thoughts on parent education and whether there's understanding and embracing flexible sort of age grade grouping there as well. I think, of course, whenever you're going to, um, when we talk about, uh, classical techniques, right, that are known and understood and they're habit-based, and then things that are contemporary that involve adult learning. Uh, but that adult learning includes parents. And so whenever you're going to look at a contemporary practice that you know that's best for kids and you know that's best for learning in your school, you have to understand that your parent population they are familiar with the industrial model or whatever was familiar with habit. So any uh, education that you push out to them, clear uh, explanations about why you're doing what you're doing and the benefits for the students and for themselves, uh, they're going to understand. They're going to be open to that a lot more than just having something change where they're not given any understanding as to why they're doing that. And I would also invite them to, to help brainstorm some options that they see as natural connections. Uh, don't always see them as a barrier. They might actually have some really good innovative ideas for you to approach that they'd be very open to. Heidi on that one. Uh, first of all, Beth Freeman, I know who you are. <laughs> I just put two and two together. How lovely to see your name after many years. So of course you'd ask a really important question like that. Um, I think that sometimes parents get anxious about their kids, of course, you know, perfectly rational people act totally irrational about their kids because it's, it's fearless, it's protective. And the best way to quell anxiety is with good information. That's right. So my, my, my take on it is to be proactive, invitational, and understand the reasons why this occurs. And most people can use common sense and do it. One, two, avoid large meetings that too often people, it doesn't get across. Smaller is better. Um, I have a group that worked on a listening tour with parents and they set up a series of events. They were virtual at the time where parents could come and get their questions answered. And the, the, the response was just terrific. So I'm thinking we use the same idea of applying numbers and grouping that we talked about earlier to parents. What would be the best format in terms of making that work? So thanks and good to hear from you, Beth. They're lucky to have you out there on Long Island. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. And let me echo Marie's um, appreciation to 
Sarah and Keenan and to Chuck. Thank you again. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank you both. And thank you everyone for tuning in today and to our uh, the series on <laughs> mapping the curriculum for a responsive learning environment. We hope you've learned a lot from these great sessions. And we really appreciate you hanging out with us today. <laughs> um, we do have another webinar series with Heidi and Marie. They're not sick of us yet. They will be back in March uh, on the 24th and the 20 and the 31st for a, another series on focusing the students, focusing on students through curriculum mapping. So we'll be learning about personalized learning and self-navigation and, and student learning. So those will be another great two sessions. And we'll make sure to include the registration for link. For link for that series in the recording email that we'll send out to everyone after the session is ended later this week. So thanks again, everyone for joining. And if you'd like to connect with Marie and Heidi, here are their emails. And I believe those are their Twitter accounts. You know, they love hearing from you guys. And so does Chalk if you want to reach out. <laughs> And, uh, and if you're interested in learning more about Chalk, please visit us at chalk.com slash demo. We're happy to show you how our tools work and how we can help you with your curriculum initiatives. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye.